Good evening. Since everybody is so quiet, I think we might as well start. <laughs> Thank you for coming to this uh, panel on 9-11 in, in 2011. My name is Michael Geisler. I'm Vice President for Language School, Schools Abroad and Graduate Programs, and also a member of the German Department here at Midbury College. First and foremost, I want to thank the panelists for taking the time to speak to us tonight, and in some cases for making long trips uh, on crazy schedules. Thank you very much. I also would like to extend my thanks to Dean of the Faculty, Jim Rao, for putting this panel together and organizing all of this. Wonderful work. Thanks a lot, Jim. And for everyone else who's helping out with this tonight. Ten years ago, almost to the day, then Dean of the Faculty, Robert Schein, asked me to put together a panel very much like this one. In the spring of 2001, together with Professor David Stoll, I had just taught what I believe was the college's first course ever on the subject of terrorism. In fact, I asked one of the brightest students in that course, Eli Sugarman, to be part of that panel. For a week or two after 9-11 happened, David Stoll and I exchanged dozens of emails with our former students, most of whom had graduated that previous spring, to try to make sense of what had just happened and to share our experiences and reactions with each other. I still remember vividly one student's email. He had landed a job in a downtown museum and, like thousands of other New Yorkers, was walking away from the city across one of the Manhattan bridges towards Queens because public transportation was hard to come by that day. Turning around, he looked at the cloud of smoke over downtown, wondering whether the world as he knew it had ceased to exist. I imagine that that question whether the attacks of 9-11 present a watershed event in US history and perhaps in the history of the world, like the attack on, on Pearl Harbor, or whether it would eventually become attenuated, a ripple in time, like so many others, will be a large part of tonight's discussion. Personally, I believe it was the former, a defining moment that will forever change the way we look at personal and collective security, at risk management, and indeed the concept of what constitutes war and what the rules of engagement will be. Speaking strictly for myself for a moment, I will say that having come here in 1976, on 9-11-2001, I felt for the first time in my life like an American, a US American to be exact, not like the German I am by birth. I felt a part of this country which had been attacked. With us today we have a group of experts from various fields who will share both their professional expertise with us and perhaps, I hope, also their personal experiences and reactions at the time, 10 years ago. Tonight, all of us are here not primarily as experts on terrorism, but to contribute our personal and professional perspectives to what I trust will be a lively discussion involving many people in this room. To enable that larger discussion, I have asked each of the panelists to restrict their comments to no more than seven to eight minutes. I will then call on some of our current students to give a first response and perhaps also share their own memories and we will widen the circle from there. It is now a pleasure to introduce our panelists. Lisa Jaffra Diaz, class of 84. Lisa is a senior member of the US franchise sales group at Goldman Sachs, covering large institutions with a focus on global hedge funds. She is also a global account captain across the securities division managing firm-wide relationships with a number of major hedge funds. Lisa has been involved in institutional sales for almost two decades, focusing on markets in the United States, in Asia and Latin America, as well as global media and telecommunications across the capital structure. She joined Goldman Sachs in 1992 and was named Managing Director in 2010. Lisa is a founding board member and leader of the Development Committee of World Fund, a non-profit organization whose mission is to raise the quality of education in Latin America. She also serves on the board of Dream Yard Project, the largest arts education provider in the Bronx. Lisa earned her degree, Phi Beta Kappa, from Middlebury College. She has been a very active alumna and was the recipient 
of the Bicentennial Award for Outstanding Alumni Contribution to Academic Excellence in 2001. Lisa lives with her husband Alex and daughters Gabriela and Alessandra in Bronxville, New York. Lisa will discuss her personal experiences being just a few blocks away from ground zero at that time. And she will also talk about how it changed her awareness of the existence of terrorism as a factor that could impact our lives. Our second speaker will be Huda Fakhredin. Huda Fakhredin is Assistant Professor of Arabic. She holds an MA in English Literature from the American University of Beirut and a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from Indiana University, Bloomington. Her research focuses on modernist Arabic poetry of the 20th century and the Arabic modernist movement as periods of literary crisis. She is also interested in the role of the Arabic Qasida, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, as a space for negotiating the foreign and the indigenous, the modern and the traditional. Huda will talk about the impact of 9-11 on the field of Middle Eastern studies or Arab studies through her experience as an Arab graduate student in the U.S. Ron Leibowitz was appointed as the 16th president of Middlebury College in April 2004. He had previously served as provost and executive vice president of the college from 1997 until his appointment as president. From 1993 to 95, he was dean of the faculty and from 1995 to 97, he was vice president of the college. From February to June 2002, Ron Leibowitz served as acting president. President Leibowitz joined the Middlebury faculty in 1984 as an, instructor, uh, as an instructor of geography and was promoted to associate professor in 1988 and full professor in 1993. He is a graduate of Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, where he majored in economics and geography and competed as a varsity swimmer. He received his doctorate in geography from Columbia University in 1985. President Leibowitz was actually in downtown Manhattan on 9-11. So he will also share with us his personal memories of the event as he witnessed it. But he also plans to talk about the joke the attacks had on how the US viewed its place in the world, on itself, the American psyche, if you will, and how it has, or at least should, force a reconsideration on how we educate our young. Joyce Mao has taught at Middlebury since 2008. A native of the San Francisco Bay Area, she received her BA, her MA, and her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. She specializes in recent American history, teaching courses on the U.S. and the world since 1898, Pacific Rim relations, and Cold War topics. She is currently revising a book manuscript on China and the post-war conservative movement. Professor Mao will talk about the impact 9-11 has had on how scholars look at the history of U.S. foreign relations. Quinn Meekham is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Middlebury College. He's a scholar of civil conflict and political Islam, focusing primarily on Turkey, the Middle East, and North Africa. He has written extensively on Islamist movements and political parties in Turkey, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, and Senegal. His book manuscript examines processes of political mobilization by religious actors across the Muslim world. He is also the co-editor of a forthcoming volume on the strategic behavior of Islamist political parties in the Middle East and Asia. He has been a research associate at George Washington University and an academy scholar at the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. He recently served as Franklin Fellow on the policy planning staff of the U.S. Department of State, working as a policy advisor to Secretary Clinton on countries of the Arab Gulf, Turkey, political Islam, and global religious affairs. He received his MA and PhD degrees in political science from Stanford University. Professor Meekham will talk about, he will actually take us inside Bin Laden's mind and he will talk about what, it, what Bin Laden really intended to accomplish with the 9-11 attacks. He will also talk about how U.S. Middle East and relations have changed as a result of 9-11, and how the Middle East itself has changed in the last decade. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Um, I just want to say a special thanks to, to 
Ron as well as Jim for inviting me um, up to Middlebury. And it's kind of interesting, today was a beautiful, brisk day as I stepped off the plane for New York. And back on 9-11, one of the most stellar memories I had is a crisp, beautiful day. And I work um, about five blocks away from um, Ground Zero in actually the other tallest building um, that is close to what were the Twin Towers. And remember that day, any of you have ever been to a big trading floor, there's about a thousand people and there's TVs everywhere. And I remember when we watched the planes or the pictures of the planes um, hitting the first tower, all of us, the commentary was, what an idiot, how did you miss the towers? It was never ever in any single pe person on that trading floor, I'm talking about thousand people, it could be an act of terrorism. I remember very vividly. And the discussion was more, not even thinking about um, what the consequences were, but it was just shock and awe that something like this could happen. And then the second plane hit. And it actually turned out our, our building um, was struck by the second plane as it circled around to go up Broadway. And the entire building shook. And I remember going out of the loudspeaker floor, they said, stay calm. I worked in emerging markets, and I have two children, and I said, I'm not listening to authority. I'm going to get my bag and get out of there. And I started to walk down 50 flights of stairs. As you walk down the 50 flights of stairs, there was hysteria and more and more information. But still, this is after two towers had been struck. People didn't think about terrorism. And these are people at Bowman Sachs. There's 48 Middlebury alumni who work at Goldman Sachs, so they're pretty well informed people. But it was not on the radio screen of anyone. And I remember going in the uh, lobby of Goldman, and there was Bob Steele, who became Undersecretary of the Treasury after Hank Paulson, and he was behind the desk and he said, Lisa, I'm on with the safety department. And I was like, good for you. And I looked outside and I saw the burning tower. And my survival instincts were stronger than anything else. I said, I'm getting out of here. I want to exit. And there was a group of people, and it was interesting, they were all from emerging markets, and we decided to walk north. And as we walked north, there were all people, again, there were starting to be some elements that could have been a terrorism, could have been an attack, but people still did not believe, even though you saw the burning two towers. They were, you know, three blocks away. And I remember having arguments with some of the people saying to people to go back to their offices saying, you're being irresponsible. You have to be, take, take, take uh, leadership in leaving. And we just walked north. And at that day, at least for me personally, it was your survival instinct at play. And the one time that I was actually scared is, I don't know if any of you spent time in New York, but right underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, I turned around and I watched the tower fall. And then I heard F-16s, and I just began to think, are we going to come and bomb again? And I was thinking about, what do I do to survive? Where am I going to protect myself so my children are not going to be without a mother? And I walked further north. And as you worked further north, you saw more and more people, and there was a consensus view that this was an act of terrorism. But it was not official. And I remember meeting my father and my brother, and I wanted to, and we live in Westchester, and I'm like, we're going to live, we're going to survive. And there was one train that went out, and we were on it. And there were all these people with, you know, sort of white, you know, dust that happened. And I remember going home, and we live about, again, half an hour north, and it was a bright, clear, calm day. And it was still unable to process what had happened. And, you know, like everybody else, I saw, I, we've lost friends, we had, um, you know, different people in the community that were, were impacted um, by the event. Um, and one of the things I want to tell you is I remember going back afterwards, and Ron, I don't know if you did that, but there was a um, dust in the air. All the military were in, um, in the park, right, at these Battery Park, and it was all kind of walled off. And I went to get my normal Starbucks, and there were all these guys in the military regalia, and I'm like, I'm tough. I'm American. I can go back. And the first day we went back, everybody was patriotic, they wanted to be there, but there was a nervousness that never existed before. And I don't know if you remember, at the same time there was anthrax, um, and the second day that we were back um, in the different trading floors, the word now got out that the difference between survival and not survival is whether you exit at the scene of the climb. And to some extent, if you divide, you divide authority. And I kind of got into trouble with my boss a bit, but there was one side of the trading floor 
who thought they saw something and they must have called the police so they exited the whole trading floor and they called me and I said, okay, time to go. And we exited again because there was this whole you know, entourage of, of fire um, and policemen, et cetera. But one of the things that fundamentally changed and I've now evacuated our building probably six times um, within the psyche when anything happens, even if it's not terrorism, people expect it to be a terrorist event, which has fundamentally changed perception um, and it's changed the environment of one of fear rather than optimism, which has always been part um, of the U.S. And I don't know if you, you saw in the newspaper, but recently with Air Force um, One, there was an incident that it came by our building again. And guess what happened? Evacuation. Ask questions later. Because that's now become the mentality. We also had a power outage, I don't know if you remember it. The, the power went out on the, uh, on the East Coast. And what was different between 9-11 is everybody had their plan. Everyone called their loved ones, had their meeting place. And it's changed perception. It's a bit of a loss of innocence that happened across the, uh, um, the, the, the fabric of people who work in Manhattan, I think in the U.S. And one of the things I was thinking about recently is there was a celebration um, once Bin Laden's mind, um, to, I don't want to say celebration, but there was a closing event um, after Bin Laden was captured. And I remember thinking there was all these signs and all this talk about victory. And I actually wondered whether he was more victorious than we were. Because what's happened in the past 10 years economically, there's been a change in terms of American sense of optimism about itself. There's a reconsideration about immigration, which historically has been the source of optimism and vibrancy in the U.S. And if you kind of think about it, it has limited Americans' ability to be flexible and to be powerful. Um, because even you think I went to the airport today, I spent like 20 minutes for people looking to protect me. So when you sort of look forward and say, what's the after effect of the past 10 years. I don't think it's a ripple. I think it's a fundamental change um, in mentality. And some of it is not always good because now it's one of fear. It's of defensiveness. It's waiting for something to go wrong rather than waiting for something to, to, to go right. So it was a tragic event. It was a transformational event um, for all of us. In our new corporate headquarters, we're not on 50, we're on four. All the trading floors are low. If you go to any corporation, the CEO doesn't want to be on the top floor. He wants to be lower down. But if you think about what the message behind that, it's a very powerful one. And it's not all positive. So um, with that, uh, and, and again, I want to be sensitive to the fact that there were lives that were lost. There were lives that were changed. But the impact for the, the broader American psyche, which I think Ron is going to talk about, I think is way more powerful than I think any of us have realized. So that's my personal remembrance. Thank you. Well, my, I'm going to talk from a very personal angle. I only went to New York for the very first time last year. On September 11, 2001, I had not left Lebanon yet. I was an undergraduate of English literature at the American University of Beirut, and I had lived all my life until that point in Beirut, Lebanon. And believe it or not, I had never heard of Osama bin Laden or Al Qaeda. I had lived in Lebanon all my life, although I come from a family that has deep connections with the U.S. My great grandfather was a U.S. citizen. He lived here for over 50 years. And all my family on my father's side are also U.S. citizens who have lived here for over 30 years. Uh, when I first heard the news of the attack, I was on the campus of AUB, and I still remember the disbelief that people were in when the news started spreading on campus. And what I remember most about people's initial reactions to the attacks uh, was that they reacted to it as if it were an attack that happened in the heart of Beirut, and not thousands of miles away. Uh, my recollections of these three actions are very similar to my recollections of reactions to the many attacks that we were subjected to during the long years of civil war in Lebanon and its aftermath. So, um, 
uh, before all the analysis and the commentary and the explanations started coming in, everybody I knew on that day reacted to the attack as if it was a personal attack. The first instinct people had was the need to make sure that their family and friends were okay. Their family and friends in New York and in, in the U.S. So the phones were down that day. There was a sense of tragedy that for a brief moment transcended the divisions of us and them. It felt like we were all terrorized, we were all attacked. Unfortunately, that sense of solidarity and empathy was soon compromised because of the war on Iraq and its uh, aftermath. When every Arab and Muslim started feeling guilty and accused almost by default. Um, as Noam Chomsky wrote a couple of days ago on the anniversary of 9-11, quoting a jihad an expert, not sure what that means or how dangerous that man is, but Noam <laughs> Chomsky quoted him saying that had the, US, uh, had the U.S. exploited the opportunity and not mobilized the movement by the war on Iraq, its consequent war on Iraq, jihadi movements or militant movements, which we're also afraid of, would have split and become much weaker. Because no sane person, even if they were Muslim and Arab, no sane person could have defended an atrocious crime against humanity like 9-11. But the war on Iraq and the attitude of the United States towards Muslims and Arabs not only justified the existence of movements like uh, of these movements, but also fostered a growing resentment towards the U.S. and justified it in many ways. Uh, I'm not always certain, I'm always shocked to, to learn that people here are not aware of the fact that Arabs in the Arab world are just as resentful and terrorized by military groups that fight in the name of Islam. And many Arabs blame the U.S. for the fact that these groups still find excuses for their existence. I personally did not experience the impact of 9-11 until I moved to the United States in 2005. Uh, and I have to say, U.S. airports, where I am always randomly selected, every single time, U.S. airports are the place where I became so very aware of myself as an Arab and a Muslim. Uh, these are labels I now declare with a certain assertion that I never had before, an assertion that makes me uncomfortable. Um, ironically, living in the United States has forced me to be assertive and final in defining certain aspects of my identity, especially aspects that I would have preferred to leave unresolved and open. Uh, here, I have to exist in narrow, clear labels, just in order to avoid being wrongly labeled by others. Um, it is after I moved to the U.S. that I realized the great impact of 9-11 on my life, and on the way people responded to me and expected me to respond to them. So since 9-11, I moved to the United States to complete my studies in comparative literature. I came here as a student interested in the study of poetry, who also happened to be an Arab. But the system responded to me as an Arab who happened to have interests in literature. Um, I and other Arab students in my situation, uh, the way we were pigeonholed, Made, created a very perplexing and challenging academic experience. Not only was it a process of labeling, but it was an attitude that kept us constantly and acutely aware of the labels that defined us. For example, I'm Lebanese, but I was, I was never so aware of being a Muslim and a Shia before I started living in post-9-11 in the United States. Unfortunately, Tragic events like 9-11, wars and conflicts have come to define the, the field of Middle Eastern studies. And these very events are the reason for its recent flourish and growth and over-enrollment and all that, unfortunately. Many good things are coming out of it, but uh, these events are the, the direct reason. And uh, Arabs in this field, whether they like it or not, whether they're qualified or not, become instant representatives and spokespersons for all Muslims, all Arabs, all Middle Easterners. Um, and frankly, when I received the invitation to be on this panel, I was a little taken aback. It, the invitation said, we would like you to speak, because of your research interests, we would like you to speak on a panel on 9-11. I have to take a moment and review my research interests. I am primarily a student of comparative literature. I wrote an MA thesis on Hamlet, 
And the PhD thesis on modernizing movements in medieval Arab poetry. But all of that becomes minor or secondary to the fact that I am a, U a Muslim Arab academic in the US. Um, before I can introduce myself as a medievalist or a comparatist, I am an Arab and a Muslim, whether I like it or not, or whether I've resolved that between me and myself or not. Uh, so yes, I guess I am here now, not because of my medieval Arab poets, but because they and I have to clear ourselves in some way. We have to cross a barrier of suspicion. We have to justify ourselves and we have to prove that we can, in some way, alleviate U.S. anxiety towards the Middle East before we can be taken seriously. This was, and still is, uh, a very unsettling situation for me because in many ways, we still rely on uh, political and strategic interests of the U.S. to find a place for the study of Arabic literature and culture in, in American universities. And Arab uh, students and scholars cannot but feel that their academic interests are always compromised. Most of them spend most of their careers teaching Arabic language, whether they want that or not, whether they're qualified to do that or not, while at the same time struggling to find small spaces on the side, ornamental corners, where they can actually bring real elements of Arabic culture and not impose an imagined ones to be recognized. Small spaces where names like Great names like the Mutanabbi and Abu Tammam are more resounding than Bin Laden and Zarqawi. Um, and these are great medieval poets. In, in, my in my experience teaching Arabic language and literature in the U.S. since 2005, I have found that in any class on the Arab world, before we say or do anything, there's so much that needs to be unsaid and undone first. I've often found myself teaching about the Middle East in resistance to what I think my students know or they think they know. And in cases like these, it cannot but become very personal. Um, even now, 10 years after 9-11, although we, still, we no longer go around the room asking students where they were on that day, we still somehow begin in that moment where the Middle East suddenly became much more visible to the U.S. Uh, in this process of unlearning and learning about the Middle East, however, I think much can be gained. I am optimistic, an optimistic Arab. I am optimistic, and especially now, as the Middle East is renewing itself and in many ways redeeming itself in the eyes of its own peoples, I think I'm very hopeful that a human, more complex face to the Middle East is going to come to light, a human face that doesn't need to constantly just Tuesday, of course, was 9-11, but on Saturday I arrived uh, ready for a leave, uh, spending time at Columbia University and also the Mellon Foundation, uh, where I had a residency invited there to spend uh, two days a week. And on this particular day, um, I was living on the Upper West Side on uh, 88th Street and West End Avenue, and I thought I would walk to 62nd Street in Lexington, where the Mellon Foundation was for a meeting that morning, a 9 o'clock meeting. Clara Yu, who was vice president here at the time, was flying in, and we were having a powwow at the Mellon Foundation for various projects we were um, discussing with other liberal arts colleges and the Mellon leadership. And as I began walking down the street, um, I decided that day was such a beautiful day I would walk. And it's normally about a 35 or 40 minute walk um, to across town uh, to the foundation. And um, unfortunately, I stopped for a bagel uh, on the way. And by stopping for a bagel, I got a little delayed. And as a result, by the time I got to 66th Street, right by Lincoln uh, Center, I realized I was not going to make this meeting on time, and so I did what I hadn't done uh, in New York City in, in probably 30 years, which was jump on a bus. Uh, I'd always walked or taken subways, never, never liked a bus, but I jumped on a cross-down 65th Street bus 
right at Lincoln Center and started to go across town. And uh, the only seats left on the bus were those seats that are um, looking out the door rather than looking forward, uh, those seats that are on the side of the bus. And um, I was looking around the bus and um, a much maybe better dressed crowd than you see in the subway. Um, all going to work, it seemed. One individual across from me was a professor, it turned out, at Hunter College, who was working over his manuscript, 400 page or so manuscript, sitting across from me. And so I was looking downtown, uh, where I was sitting, and um, we came um, towards Central Park West in our flight, and the bus stopped, and a woman got on the bus, and she was all frazzled, it was about 10 to 9, and she was incredibly frazzled, and she was shaking, and no one paid attention to her, typical of a New York morning. And she sat down and she said, mumbled, um, she said, uh, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. I saw it on my TV before I came out of the bus. And no one even blinked or no one even paid her a mention. And I, I did because I had nothing in my hand. I thought I was going to walk to the foundation, so I had nothing to read. And I just looked at her and I just said, uh, well, what kind of plane? And she said, uh, a small passenger plane. They think it was a small passenger plane that hit the, the World Trade Center. Um, as Lisa said also, no one suspected terrorism. I certainly didn't at that time. I had heard of planes hitting other buildings in New York over the years. Uh, and so I just continued looking at this woman who was obviously frazzled. By the time the bus stopped um, a second time, uh, we got stopped, stuck for a while. By the time we came out uh, of the park, uh, a woman in front of the bus actually stood up in the front of the bus. She had a Walkman on. She turned around. And she said to the whole bus, a second plane just hit the World Trade Center, and it wasn't an accident. The interesting thing at that moment was, uh, I looked around the bus, and interestingly, every woman on that bus, almost immediately, unlike the traders on the floor at Goldman, uh, realized, I think, what was happening. And they literally started to cry. The shaking and the tears that were coming down the eyes of the women on the bus, the men were lost, looking around like, hey, what's going on? We all had this look about us. But it was clear that the women on the bus um, recognized what was going on. The bus comes out on Madison and turns uptown. Everyone on the bus got out. Every single person got out of the bus. I walked across from Madison uh, to Park and over to Lexington, two blocks to the east, and, um, and I turned uptown uh, to go to 62nd Street. And um, you can see by this time, of course, uh, smoke coming out of the towers downtown. Uh, straight on Lexington Avenue, you can see it downtown. And everybody had come out of their shops uh, to look downtown. At that point, cell coverage was gone. I took my cell phone out uh, to try to see you know, what was going on. And I couldn't, uh, of course, have any contact. I didn't know what was going on. By the time I got to 62nd Street, Clara and I had agreed to meet in a little coffee uh, cafe right across from the Maryland Foundation where we always had met. I went in there. She wasn't there. Uh, I knew she was on an early morning flight. And, uh, and I heard someone say that they understand, stood that the planes were coming down the Hudson River and came right into the center. I said, oh, was that plane coming from Burlington? Uh, and I sat down and also Clara popped in, <coughs> shaking. Uh, she was on the Grand Central Parkway when the second plane hit uh, the, 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 um, the tower. And um, she was really shaking and was sat inside and decided to go right into the foundation uh, across the street. We spent a day there uh, at the foundation. Uh, Bill Bowen was the president of the foundation that invited everyone upstairs to the fifth floor. We all watched on television and was just you know, uh, horrified to see what was going on. We all stayed there until the first tower fell. At that point, everybody in the room was so upset. Uh, they left and they were upset because about four or five workers at the foundation had spouses who were working in the World Trade Center. No one could want to think about what was happening at the time. So spent a day there, um, and the interesting thing about it was it, it was an immediate aha moment on the bus for the women, not for us, but of course, by the time we got to the foundation, we realized this was a terrorist act. We spent a day at the foundation, as I said. Many of us put people up who were visiting the foundation because, as many of you know, all the transportation routes were closed. You got out early, but everything else was closed down, bridges, subways, trains, everything, so hotels. So we basically put people up. I stayed very late at night uh, at the foundation uh, with the other people there. I must have left at 8 o'clock or 8.30 at night. The interesting thing about it during the day was to see the mass of people walking uptown from downtown. Here I was in midtown Manhattan in the 60s, and you just saw just armies and armies of individuals coming forward. Uh, I walked through the park that night. You couldn't get a cab because it was dead. The east side of Manhattan was a desert, a desert, deserted town. You couldn't see anything. It was interesting, by the time you got to the west side and you, get to, uh, you got to Columbus Avenue, which has a lot of outside cafes and so forth, there was some sense of tourists enjoying themselves and so forth, plus the rest of the city was, was, was pretty dead. The days that followed were kind of remarkable because if you remember, this is a cool, crisp time. Winds were coming from the northwest, so the upper west side of Manhattan was, was you didn't have any sense of what was going on. Two days later, 
the, the winds were burst from the south, and all of a sudden the whole Upper West Side was covered with what was in the south part of Manhattan, of course, and the whole city or the whole part of the Upper West Side was wearing masks walking around. It was, you were in a daze. The one thing I'll comment on uh, at, the, at the moment was, uh, first of all, the, um, the fear that, of course, um, as Lisa said, gripped almost everyone. Um, you know, I didn't go get my Starbucks. I was in Sao Macho. I was wondering what the hell I was doing in New York on a leave, my first leave in millions of years, it seems, and here I was in the midst of this. I went to Colombia, uh, where everything changed um, over the course of the next four months. Um, every single symposium, every single academic um, event, from lectures to whatever people were working on turned into something having to do with the Middle East. It was the impact of these attacks uh, in the Middle East on U.S. whatever. Um, my research project almost went, and went out the window at the time because uh, you couldn't get anyone to talk about anything or focus on anything else, even in an academic institution like Columbia, except on these attacks. What I will say, uh, uh, turning to the issue of American psyche, was first of all, um, the remarkable transformation uh, of New York City uh, for an extended period of time. Of course, this has been written about and experienced by many, um, but the, uh, the civility that took over in New York, uh, a show of patriotism, a show of civility, a show of fear perhaps, uh, that permeated the taxi cabs, the subways. Um, I remember a day when I, I got stuck in 59th Street. I was down in the subways trying to get home, and it was jam-packed at rush hour, and it was as calm as you've ever imagined a crowd in New York City. In fact, you couldn't believe that you were in New York City when the subway was delayed by more than 20 minutes, and everybody stayed calm, and everybody stayed cool. It was quite a remarkable scene, uh, and also feeling of unity in New York City. And if anything, it had to give one hope about what, 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 what was possible uh, in, into the future. Of course, that didn't last. Uh, it took perhaps only within a year for uh, New York to return to what it was. But that civility was really something to behold. In terms of the American psyche, I think um, the interesting thing, and, and listening to Lisa really underscores this for me, um, I'm optimistic as well, um, but I think 9-11 was truly a watershed uh, in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, I think it highlighted uh, for Americans um, that the insularity that permeated the way in which we view the world uh, was done. Uh, it might not be done for our generation, and in fact, hearing Lisa speak, it reminds me that it's our generation that's having a hard time uh, overcoming what 9-11 stood for, and in fact, we should. Uh, we experienced the world and we experienced American uh, confidence and psychology that really didn't care much about the world. Uh, the changes that went on in the world for the last half of the 20, 20th century were, were really ignored by us, and really 9-11 shook the foundation and woke us up. It woke us up in ways that I think alerted us to how we hadn't prepared our society for uh, the post-9-11 world, for a society that was changing rapidly that we just ignored. Uh, we had been protected. We had been falsely protected. And the optimistic note that I'll end on here um, is that Whereas we can stand here and look back pre-9-11 and uh, talk about how horrible that event was, the generations that came after 9-11 uh, really don't know of that past, and they know about the present. And I'm optimistic because the generations that came after 9-11, um, this is the world that they know, this is the world that they operate in, and this is the world in which they themselves will find hope and find ways uh, to move this country forward and not think constantly back on the pre-9-11 world that we all knew. So our generation, in a sense, um, might be lost in terms of coming to terms with what 9-11 meant. But I think the generation is going forward, and this is where I'm optimistic again, um, understand the world as it is today. And I think they will not fall into the same situation that the previous or the prior uh, pre-9-11 generations did. talking about the intellectual impact that 9-11 had on my field, which is U.S. diplomatic history. But I think that what I'd like to raise has a lot of through lines with what's been said before by the previous speakers. But I'll start by noting where I was. In the autumn of 2001, I was in California, just starting my second year of the Ph.D. program at UC Berkeley. On the morning of September 11, most of us on the West Coast turned on the news to images of flame, debris, and fear that had already existed for hours. We'd gone to bed in one reality and awoke in another. 
And the rest of the morning, I remember, passed in a blur um, as my roommate and I tried to uh, get a handle on the news. Now that semester, I was a teaching assistant for a 20th century US course, and there was a lecture that was actually scheduled for that afternoon. I knew I had to go, and in a way, it was a sort of relief from the obsessive compulsion of um, consuming information that was fragmented at best. During the walk to campus, I wondered if anybody else would show up. When I arrived, the lecture hall, a space much like this one, was full. A sense of shell shock pervaded the room, but it was clear that students already wanted to process the historicity of what had just happened. The professor offered some initial thoughts and then opened the floor for discussion. I very clearly remember one student asking, is this the beginning of something or is it the end? And another chiming in rather, mat rather matter of factly um, with the answer of neither. Intentionally or not, their exchange grappled with the theme of change versus continuity. And this is something that's been raised by everybody um, before, I, before my address. One of the key frameworks of historical interpretation is change versus continuity. Were the attacks a radical break with past precedent? Did they comprise a redefinition of some kind, or were they somehow familiar? In the immediate aftermath of the morning's events, there hardly seemed to be any clear answers. Ten years and two wars later, resolving that dialectic is much more contentious than ever. Neither side can be definitively right or wrong, and because of that, the mere declaration of historical continuity or change is not enough. Within each answer lies a host of opposing perspectives. I was reading the Washington Post online on Saturday, and I came across uh, George Will's column, uh, which appears twice a week. And in that Saturday column, Will took the side of historical continuity. He diagnosed 9-11 as just one part of a long-standing pattern of attacks by radical Islamists, while something like Pearl Harbor marked the start of something new. Now, a counter-argument to Wills might say that, yes, 9-11 was part of the pattern, but a pattern of questionable overseas intervention that continued with costly campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I won't delve into the 500 online comments that uh, responded to Bill's assessment, but I will say that about half of them um, agreed with him, and the other half, well, they made negative comments that I'm sure made his bow tie stand on end. Now, in truth, whether you interpret September 11 as an example of change or one of continuity, the assessment looks great. If this is indeed a new era, it is one defined by insecurity and division over the United States' role in the world. On the other hand, placing 9-11 within broader contexts, such as the Cold War or economic globalization, calls into question processes long hailed as markers of American exceptionalism. However, there is one arena in which 9-11 represents an obvious break from past practices, and that's the study of American diplomatic history. The challenge of placing the events of that day and the subsequent wars within a narrative of national development has prompted historians to reconfigure the very definition of the term foreign relations. The actions taken by Al-Qaeda, an extra-state organization, revised commonly held definitions of international engagement. Moreover, simultaneous assaults on structures of global capitalism as well as the American military defense state, were stark reminders that, are, that there have long been many vehicles for the projection of American ideals and interests, whatever those may be. Similarly, responses to those ideals and interests have not, have not necessarily been confined to state dialogue or other regulated channels. There's been a lot of recent attention uh, paid by scholars to alternate forms of diplomacy in the private sector. And that's yielded a wealth of new research that attempts to look at all angles of the United States' historical place in the world. Topics that have formerly been on the margins of inquiry, like race, immigration, and religion, they now share the center. Experiences of ordinary citizens who engage with the wider world are also given their proper due. One glance at the most recent table of contents for the field's flagship journal offers tangible proof that foreign relations are no longer understood mainly within a governmental rubric. The September issue has articles on subjects ranging from the Rand Corporation to the role of emotion in Cold War policymaking to the grassroots truth movement. 
Now this intellectual awakening has happened really remarkably quickly. Similar to the way West Coasters struggle to play catch-up on the morning of 9-11, there can often be a time lag between current events and academic response. I would venture to say that in the past, diplomatic history has been especially slow to change. For decades, the study of American internationalism focused primarily on institutional diplomacy. And by this I mean treaties and wars and governmental policy and elite officials in a room together. That perspective can perhaps be attributed to the 50-year backdrop of the Cold War, a conflict most often understood in terms of bilateralism and brinksmanship. The present balance of interpretations, forged from the bottom up as well as the top down, yield a historical record that is richer and more varied in texture. It's by no coincidence that my own work has been influenced by the recent redirection. 9-11 coincided with the year I finished coursework at Berkeley and began to hone a dissertation topic. I knew I wanted to write about conservatism after World War II, but I struggled with how to translate that into a sustainable long-term project. The rhetoric of the Bush administration and its declaration of military deployment to the Middle East prompted me to explore the Cold War origins of the right's approach to foreign affairs. So I would say my development as a scholar has very much been a product of the period after 2001. Tonight I've offered only a brief assessment of September 11th's impact upon one specific branch of academia. However, the changes to the entire intellectual community that were sparked by that day, by the subsequent information about why and how the attacks were manifested, and by the federal state's response, are major parts of what make 9-11 the subject of commemoration. Our presence here tonight is a testament to the collective desire to seek meaning out of an unconscionable human tragedy. The debates over 9-11's historical place won't soon be resolved, but the vigor of those debates is a measure of the democratic impulse to inquire and think critically about our past. Thanks. Sixth grade uh, was uh, what came to mind for, for most folks, um, which is uh, it's often a nice idea to go back to sixth grade. But for me, uh, the week of 9 11 2000, when I was at home, I was packed uh, and I was ready to travel to the Middle East, uh, where I was to spend a year on the full right now. Uh, in fact, my, my plane was scheduled to leave uh, on the 12th of September. Uh, because of the closure of American air traffic, I was delayed for a week or so, and I got a chance to field a lot of questions about where I was going and why I was going there. It was a time of great fear and uncertainty about what would come next, both at home and in the countries of the Middle East, uh, an area that I had really grown to love in graduate school. Preparing for this discussion tonight caused me to dig up an old uh, newspaper editorial that I wrote that week, uh, week of 9-11, when the memories and the grief were still very raw. Uh, for me included. And I wrote then, quote, my generation did not fight in World War II or in Vietnam. We have seen nothing like this. We have felt nothing like this on a national scale. We will now be defined by how we allow this event to change us. Will we become more hostile, angry, xenophobic, and embittered? Will we become more sensitive, grateful, spiritual, and united in the hope for the future? I honestly believe that it can be the latter. In the end, we are certain, though, to become more real, to feel more human, we now recognize in a renewed way both our own frailty and the enduring triumph of our collective spirit." End quote. I hadn't uh, looked at that for a decade, and uh, looking back today at what I said then, I do so um, with both a sense of disappointment and satisfaction about where we've come. Uh, disappointment in that I think many of the big decisions and attitudes in the aftermath of 9-11 have been fueled by fear and have cost us dearly, both politically, economically, and culturally. Uh, the satisfaction, though, comes in recognition, and I echo some of Ron's comments here, of the amount that we've learned since then, 
uh, both because we've recognized and acted upon the need for better understanding, uh, but also in large part to the consequences of our mistakes since 9 11. We now know actually quite a bit uh, about what 9 11 meant to those who perpetrated the attacks. In the aftermath of 9 11, Bin Laden and those who chose to follow him articulated in some detail what 9 11 meant to them, both intellectually and emotionally. It meant great sacrifice in the name of a higher cause, one battle in a long war whose winner they ultimately felt they knew. It was justified by a whole catalog of wrongs, including military attacks in Arab countries and wavering American support for Israel's occupation of Palestine, economic bullying, exploitation and inequality, American drug use, the exploitation of women, human rights violations, and above all, the hypocrisy and double standards in applying American values at home versus abroad. Bin Laden's vision of the United States, for me, was a little bit like looking at America in a funhouse mirror. I don't know if you've been to the funhouse lately, but they have these mirrors and you, it, it misshapes, you know, you're short or tall or have a giant belly, whatever it does to you, uh, where certain features are diminished, right, and others are blown way out of proportion. His America is not my America, but when I squint hard enough, uh, I could recognize pieces of it. He was smart enough uh, to understand that there was actually a good argument that even this whole litany of wrongs does not justify the mass killing of civilians. His response to this was always, the American people live in a country where they choose their leaders and they choose their policies. The American people have the ability to change the policies of their government if they want to. So the American people are as culpable as their leaders. In some ways, I think the effects of 9-11 on the United States were even greater than Bin Laden dared to dream, and he was a big dreamer. And in other ways, they fell short of his astounding ambitions. 9-11 was designed uh, as an event to provoke a widespread conflict between countries and non-state actors uh, in the Muslim world and those in the West. The American response to it, that of mobilizing militarily for a global war on terror, went some distance actually in helping Al-Qaeda achieve that goal. If the attacks would simply have been defined, this was one option at the time, defined them as a criminal act perpetrated by a small number of unrepresented individuals, this would have narrowed the scope of the U.S. response and would have been much less likely to play into Al-Qaeda's clash of civilizations narrative. Ten years later, that civilizational narrative has increasingly fallen victim, I think, to the information uh, that comes with globalization. Because that class is fundamentally false in so many respects, it hasn't been able to be sustained in full force uh, over time as we get more information around the world. After the fact, Al-Qaeda also argued that 9-11 was designed to bankrupt the United States. The American response to 9-11 isn't the only thing that has steered the U.S. economy to an unsustainable debt burden, but it is certainly a major piece of that puzzle. Good estimates put the decade-long costs of our response to 9-11 as high as $4 trillion. Now, if that number means nothing to you, uh, it is about 60 times uh, the amount the U.S. government spent on education last year, more than 150 times the amount that it spent on agriculture. Depending on the estimates, it costs close to about $1 million to send one soldier to fight in Afghanistan or Iraq for one year. 9-11 uh, attacks were likely planned and executed for much less than the cost of a single soldier deployed in the Middle East. The extent to which 9-11 was designed to change the political culture of the United States, I think, is not so clear. But our culture, and I echo our panelists here, has changed to one where we have prioritized security in a narrowly defined sense prioritizing it over other values which may provide a better long-term investment in our well-being. Fear can be a great catalyst for passing policies that might not hold up so well under the daylight uh, of sobriety. What has the 9-11 and the U.S. response meant in the Middle East? Well, it varies a lot. For some countries it meant invasion, occupation, hosting military bases, with whatever that came to imply. For Iraq, which was not in any way tied to the events of 9-11. It meant the toppling of a feared leader and the inauguration of a horrific civil war. For Afghanistan, it meant a long period of fragile state building and ongoing and increasingly expanding conflict. 
for many Arab autocrats, it meant being handed a free ticket to repress their political oppositions in the name of preventing terror. For most individuals in the Middle East, it meant their, and, uh, I, I saw what Huda was talking about over and over again in the immediate outcome. It meant their immediate and unconditional disavowal of Al-Qaeda and an outpouring of sympathy for the United States. That was quickly followed by the need to repudiate the successive military actions by the U.S. and to publicly question its motivations and intentions behind it. Over time, as the last decade progressed, for many individuals in the Middle East, it increasingly looked like business as usual for citizens with few rights and few opportunities within their political systems. I think, just to conclude, it is fitting that we pause to assess this last decade's lessons of the impact of the run. But 9-11 doesn't hold the answers to how to think about the Middle East going forward. The Middle East is no longer in a 9-11 world. It is living actually in a 2-11 world. 2-11 uh, being the date when the ruler of the largest Arab country, Egypt, was uh, almost miraculously, if you followed uh, Arab history, forced out of power by a massive showing of nonviolent people power. What 9-11 has come to symbolize about the conflict between the West and a particular vision of revolt uh, against that Western caricature is less and less relevant throughout the Middle East. The storyline that most Arabs are listening to is not a storyline of Islam versus the West. It is a storyline of justice, of equity, of opportunity, and above all, of personal dignity at home. To the extent that the United States is implicated as either a hindrance uh, to those values or as a facilitator of those ambitions, the United States is going to remain relevant to this new Middle Eastern narrative. The faster I think that we can move out of the 9-11 world and get ourselves into that 2-11 world, both politically and culturally, the more likely this country is to escape being on the wrong side of the new Middle Eastern narrative. For being on the wrong side of that current narrative would be, in fact, to my mind, a betrayal of those same values for which American citizens have sacrificed for hundreds of years, and for which the sacrifices are now daily ongoing in many countries in the Middle East. Thanks. Thank you very much to our panelists. And uh, we'll now open up for discussion. Uh, I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, we would like to start ideally with having some students ask some questions or give us some comments before um, throwing open the floor to everybody else. And unless you are really good at projecting or have acting classes <coughs> in your past or both, um, I would encourage you to please come to one of two microphones uh, positioned on either side of the room. Uh, so that we can all hear what you have to say because I think all contributions are very important for everyone and that would also um, spare us having to repeat questions uh, so that everyone can understand. Sorry, uh, you guys are with me. Well, anyway, <laughs> I was curious. It seems like with 2020 hindsight, I mean, Iraq was obviously a huge fiasco. A lot of the policies the U.S. implemented after 9-11 turned out to be a disaster for a whole host of things, whether that's foreign policy, the economy, or what have you. But what would you have done differently if you were in, or what would you have told Bush to do differently if you were in that meeting, or in the secure White House room after the attacks took place? Like, what, what would you have said? <laughs> I know what I would have said. Wait. One of the um, issues, um, those, it's an issue of shock and frozen. And I think there's a tendency, and it's the American tendency, to take immediate reaction and not to understand the intricacies of the consequences of your decision. So I remember, again, um, we were all revved up. We had our, our flags. Um, we had mostly men on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs um, <laughs> rather than women who reacted. Um, and one of the things, no one ever asked the question, okay, so if in fact we're successful in suppressing 
this military action, which is not an entire nation, but a group of radical elements, how are you actually going to run the country? And so instead of reacting, I would have said, hold on, let's think about the consequences. Let's think about, let's look at for a year, two years from now. Is this the legacy that you want to leave behind? And if you think about the changes in nation state development, sometimes pacifism is a more um, powerful impact to society at large. And going back to that same point, you look at um, George Bush, you know, I, I, I'm you know, not making a comment on political view, but it was not thoughtful enough. There was not enough of consideration of the view of the Arab world. And there was an opportunity, I remember my family is from Ireland, and there was a period of, of pause in between. And from the Irish standpoint, from the European standpoint, they said he was being reactionary. He was not looking at the consequences. So I would have said, hold on, let's get the intellectual. Let's talk to the Arab world. Let's understand the consequences of what we do. Because it feels good to beat the guy up, but then after his nose is bloody, you've actually behaved more like um, the aggressor. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. Magic. Uh, just a couple comments on that. And I alluded to them uh, in my remarks. But getting the framing right of how to understand this event uh, was really critical. And I think it, we didn't get it quite right. Uh, framing it as a criminal act, act by uh, an organization uh, is different than framing it as a global war on terror. Uh, it implies different things about what you do. It implies that you have an obligation to go and disrupt that organization's ability to carry out a similar attack. I think that would have been entirely appropriate and absolutely demanded by the political climate, uh, but without a doubt. Uh, that means that military action is important. It means that uh, at the time, Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan, and that you had to go in and do something about that organization. But keeping that uh, a relatively narrow focus, uh, I think, would have made a big difference in terms of the implications of where we go and what we spend, and uh, it would have not implied anything uh, about Maybe I'll add something to that. Um, one of the first calls that came in um, after 9-11 had happened was from the then, the then mayor of Tehran, um, Ahmadinejad, um, who was in a, in a position of relative power, but not the same position that he had later on. We never reacted to that phone call. I sometimes wonder what would have happened, this is Monday morning quarterback, obviously, if instead of calling um, uh, Iran and, uh, and um, various other states, the, the axis of, of evil, um, President Bush had decided to start a dialogue at that time um, to, to separate out particular countries. I think personally the, the attack on, on, on Afghanistan was probably hard to avoid at that time politically. Uh, I think you, know, you, can, you can argue that there would have been other steps, but I think it would have been a political hard sell. Judging by how Europeans reacted, including the Germans who said at that time, we are all Americans now, and um, uh, fell all over themselves to offer troops for an, for an attack on, on, Afghanistan, of, on, on, on Afghanistan, which actually necessitated stepping outside of the German constitution, which um, did not permit um, deploying troops outside of Germany because of the history of World War II and all of that. So I think that was, that was part of the reaction. Another piece that I think was interesting that he did say at the time was, to go out shopping and people laughed at that, but I think actually it was not such a bad reaction because um, one of the strategic goals of Bin Laden was also to attack the US economy and arguably that is where he has been most successful. Uh, you know, since we've spent, we spent $6.6 .6 million for every dollar that the 9-11 attack actually cost Bin Laden for a total of $3.3 trillion. Um, one of the discussions we could have had um, would have been how much security is necessary and at what point have we, have we overdone done it. Can we eliminate risk or do we contain risk? Those are the kinds of conversations that I think could have also have, have been had at that time. Please. Um, many of you have spoken about um, how much sort of the, the military conflicts 
that followed 9-11 cost. Um, and you've also talked about sort of the patriotism that was sort of surrounding the United States at that time. Um, I don't really know to what extent um, we could have funded the war at that time through some kind of war tax. Um, but do you think, um, and there maybe there was, and I'm just not even, I didn't know about that. Um, but do you think, given those two factors, the fact that everyone was, was sort of standing together, and at that time, do you think we could have instituted something like that? I'd like to, I'd like to respond to that. Um, I think the way that you describe unity and patriotism, the surge of uh, sort of nationalism that came after immediately after 9/11. Yes, it did exist, but I would qualify that by saying there were also many dissenting voices as well, not in terms of um, you know, that this was a horrible thing that that had happened, but what it meant already. And you know, I can, you, what the historical um, sort of parallel I would say in a similar situation is, you know, what happened before Pearl Harbor, World War II had already started, but the United States hadn't been involved yet. And there were many different opinions about what the United States should do in terms of involving itself in an overseas conflict. And you know, in the 30s, there was a strong push for internationalism, but there was just a strong push uh, for pacifism. And um, some would call it isolationism in a sort of negative way, but others called it pacifism and spun it in a more positive light. And I think after 9-11, in the wave of um, reaction to those horrible images and um, the wave of fear that happened afterwards as well led to a sort of presumption that there was this unity about what to do. And you know that quickly fell apart with the protests that you saw in the streets of New York and on university campuses um, around the country when uh, military campaigns were um, announced. So you know I would question Dan, you know that assumption that there is the, there was this sort of um, patriotic solidarity that was engendered by 9-11. And um, I would think about perspective in terms of assessing the longevity or non-longevity of that, so. I'll just say two things briefly. First is that uh, I remember the tone at the time being one of, uh, you know, budgets are out the window. Uh, whatever it takes, we just need to get this done. Uh, and uh, you know, military spending has always been a tricky thing for the United States uh, to budget uh, when it comes to these kinds of things. And so uh, there wasn't a really rich discussion about funding at the time. It was much more of a sense of urgency uh, about what to do. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember uh, teaching uh, at that, that year. I was on a program. I was teaching at a Turkish university, um, and going to the patriotism piece that Joyce was just was talking about, uh, I remember uh, asking my students, my Turkish students at the time, to reflect on the American media versus the Turkish media. And so to try to make a call, how free is the American media compared to the Turkish media? And you know, something that I was relatively familiar with, there were certain red lines that you don't cross in the Turkish media, it's not a completely uh, free press, uh, but almost universally. Uh, after having watched a lot of CNN, right, uh, these Turkish students said, oh, the Turkish media, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10 is a 9, and the American media is, is a 2. Uh, and what they were observing was they were observing American flags flying in the corner uh, of news articles, right, on CNN. They were observing this massive outpouring of visual uh, unity that was really shaped the way that the media talked about patriotism and about the United States at the time. Uh, that you know was largely self-selected, right? That was the, the market and the audience that the that US media was appealing to. But it came across to an outside audience as being uh, you know amazingly self-serving uh, in generating this unity and this patriotism that, that may or may not have been. Um, I'm just going to stand up like this. Uh, just speak up, please. I will. Uh, so a couple of you mentioned um, optimism and there, that there might have been a shift in sort of American, uh, the American attitude. We become maybe more pessimistic, more um, 
less trusting, less trusting, more fearful. Uh, and I think, I think I've seen that uh, to some degree in my own community, in my own family. But, um, but I think there has always been sort of terrorism to some degree. There's always been an inse- insecurity. Now we, we there is more technology. There is uh, the ever-present threat of sort of terrorism from non-state actors that is maybe less predictable than ever before. But, um, you know, in the Cold War, we had a constant threat almost of nuclear war, you know, something that could decimate all of us in the blink of an eye. Um, and in the 18th century, 17th century, they had pirates, so, uh, which were, you know, terrorists of their time. Um, so my question is, is there something fundamentally different about 9-11 and about this type of insecurity that we have now that uh, causes us to be truly more fearful, less secure than we have been before? Have we lost some of our trust and some of our optimism? Uh, really? Uh, or and, it, and if so, is that, is that something that we can recover? Or is it, has it just changed who we are? Or has the modern world changed who we are, I guess? Thank you. Well, that, that question raises a really interesting point about 9-11 as a post-Cold War moment. Or maybe we could think about it in terms of um, a sort of epilogue to the Cold War. I mean, you talk about the threat of nuclear war and you know, this constant sort of fear of annihilation. Well, you know, I would say that the Cold War, yes, it had its you know, incredibly intense moments. But at the same time, there was a certain regulation to the dialogue between the Soviet Union and the United States. There was communication, and there was a certain degree of um, sort of uh, sort of cooperation with one another. There was a there was a, there were regulated channels for dialogue. I think one of the major things that's different about the time that we're, uh, the United States is operating in the world right now is that um, you know there are many more there are even more factors to contend with. And a lot of them cannot be confined to for formal forums of diplomacy. And I think that um, you know that's one of the challenges that the U.S. state is facing and continues to face. And one of the reasons why the Bush administration reorganized the state as it did in a, in a sort of response to this new threat. But um, I think you know Quinn's uh, talk raised a really good point about how formal policy and government response can't always match the challenge that's out there. And so, um, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer as to whether or not we're going to regain that optimism that, you know, marked American superpower for so long. But I think that, you know, one thing to kind of contemplate is how a foreign policy can be more nimble in its response to all these other factors that are now in existence, or as you point out, have been in existence for quite some time, but just haven't come to the fore as they have as an order to show. Um, thank you. Um, hello everyone, I'm Nana and I'm from Pakistan and uh, I'm a freshman here at Middlebury College. Um, I actually don't have a question to ask, but I just want to share my thoughts about um, the 9-11 and uh, the aftermath. Since I come from a country which is actually um, on the front line uh, when we talk about terrorism or counterterrorism, and uh, since the fact that um, Osama bin Laden or whoever that is was found in my country, um, um, this is my first time in the U.S. and before coming to U.S. I had some fears in me. Um, saying that I don't know what kind of um, resentment would I get, what kind of um, feelings would I be uh, faced with and how people would react to me. But um, I found that people here in the U.S. are very uh, liberal in their thinking and they are very welcoming and very friendly that I found in Middlebury. Um, In Pakistan, I would say that the situation now is quite bad in terms of security because every day is a day when you have to hear at least one news about bomb blasts. 
and my father himself um, escaped two bomb blasts in Pakistan. So I can understand clearly how people whose families were involved in the 9-11 um, uh, incident uh, would have felt. And, uh, but there are uh, a lot of uh, people, um, especially in the tribal areas of Pakistan, um, who after 9-11, since there has been this um, influx of terrorist organizations coming into that area of Pakistan, there are many families who, are, uh, who have lost a lot of their loved ones. And I would say that uh, for them, in my country, there is a 9-11 every day for one person in Pakistan. So considering that, I mean, I have sympathy, and many people in Pakistan have their sympathy for U.S. citizens, and we would just like pray that we may get peace as soon as possible. Thank you. Two questions. One, I'd like to get the panelists' opinions on the increased power um, in the FBI and other intelligence agencies and the growth of the surveillance state um, in the U.S. after 9-11. And if these new policies and this new power is something that's there, that's keeping us safe and it's working or if it's a dangerous increase in government power. And also just your thoughts on, one, one panelist mentioned the, uh, the past, brand of pacifism in America and the protests against the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and I'm wondering what you why do you think that that strand has not come to the forefront with the recent intervention in Libya? I'll tackle, I'll tackle you the second part of your question first about uh, Libya and the lack of protest regarding that. I think um, the nature of the coalition, the formal coalition, the NATO coalition that has taken the helm um, of the campaign in Libya certainly kind of de-escalates the United States' role in, uh, in terms of support of infrastructure of the um, Libyan campaign and the um, sort of awareness that a lot of Americans have of what's going on in that part of the world. And I also would offer the uh, assessment that there's a lot of fatigue out there right now in terms of overseas involvement, wars, there, and you know, certainly the domestic developments that have happened since uh, 2001 have worn down a lot of um, consciousness that might otherwise have been there in other times. So that's you know, one perspective. Um, as for the surveillance state and the FBI, um, I, I, really, um, I really personally believe that the growth of the federal state in that direction is incredibly dangerous. Um, I mentioned that lecture that I went to on 9-11 and that American history class. Well, the very first thing that the professor said when she got to the podium that afternoon was, we need to watch for our civil liberties and the civil liberties of others because they're going to be endangered by this incident. And that was the first thing she said. And nobody you know, in the room had a response to that. You know, in terms of you know forethought and foresight that this could this could mean you know something really horrible for everyday American lives in terms of surveillance by our own state. And so I really internalized that comment in a lot of ways, and I watched with alarm in terms of how the federal state has grown, the reorganization, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, the reshuffling of immigration to the Department of Homeland Security is sort of unconscionable in my mind. So my personal belief is that, yes, there is a real danger to a continued pattern of federal growth in that direction, while so many other pressing issues, um, in addition to security, are left neglected. Um, healthcare, for example. So, you know, that's, that's sort of my two cents on that particular topic. I'm sure other people have other um, maybe I, I, if I could respond to, to part of that as well. Um, I, I was interviewed by some of the local media um, when 9-11 happened, and um, I expressed the same concern that we were putting our civil liberties on the line, and I'm still concerned about that, um, probably being somewhat overly sensitive to that given the history of my own uh, country. Um, 
Uh, and, but I think one needs to separate out uh, what the Patriot, the Patriot Act may do or not do and what has happened to the FBI uh, since 9-11. And um, in our terrorism class, one of the quotes I'd like to start out with is uh, Philip Heyman, who published a book um, a couple of years before 9-11 happened, former, a few uh, generations removed, former deputy director of the US, uh, of, of, of the FBI, who uh, published a book called Terrorism in, in America. And in that, he said, among other things, that one of the accomplishments we had made over the last few years, this was before 2001, uh, where we had really made progress at considerable cost, but enormous progress was airline security. Um, that is pretty um, uh, typical of where the FBI was at that time. And it was, uh, if you read the history leading up to 9-11, the FBI was, was not very well prepared. And you all know the story about the various intelligence agencies um, it is not working very well together in sharing information. You may remember the Phoenix Memo and a few other stories from, from that time. I should say that um, we do have recruiters from, from the FBI on campus for the language schools every year, and we, we, we talk to them a little bit. There's not a lot of information they can share with us, of course, but I personally have a belief that um, uh, based on what I have heard that there has been enormous progress made and I think we need to separate out our concerns about civil liberties which I share very much which how we actually assess the progress that, that, that has been made in some of those areas and one of the things that um, people we know point out to us from time to time is it is not just luck and not just coincidence that we have not had a major um, attack being successful since 9-11. Some of those were coincidences where we were a little lucky, but there have also been a lot of attacks that were discovered early on in international cooperation. I think we should be careful to separate out those two. Um, the potential attack on our, civil, on, on our civil liberties, which we need to be concerned about, and the actual progress that has been made in some of the federal agencies entrusted with the, with the fight against terrorism. Those, those costs of war, about $4 trillion, highlighted. Uh, I, as I was walking over here, I was just imagining how I would spend $4 billion. Uh, and it wouldn't be uh, out of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, just, I mean, it's not that there aren't valuable things to do there, but, just, but when you start to think about the long term investment trade offs and what you're getting for your money, uh, there are so many amazing investments that you could be making in this country. And you know, who we are and what values we hold and what, how we define ourselves with those values, I think. It is the other big question that we have to think very carefully about. Uh, fear is a powerful emotion, and it is used all of the time as a trump card uh, over other values and over more rational prioritization. So I, I do have some concerns on that. Uh, Obama on Libya, I just want to say two things uh, on Libya. One is that uh, I read his decision to go into Libya is actually quite values driven. Uh, people in his administration, uh, that were in the Clinton administration uh, during the Rwanda genocide, were very key to helping advise on that decision uh, to protect civilians. Uh, so it wasn't entirely self-serving, and there aren't clear strategic interests in the United States in going into Libya uh, the same way there might be in other situations. But he's been very clever in passing off the leadership uh, to the, the Brits and the French. Uh, I actually think it's, it's absolutely the right move. I think the United States uh, has an interest in something happening in Libya, but it has an interest in not leading that change. Please. Um, I'm actually a student of Arabic um, at this school, and I'm really lucky to be able to be in a class where I learn all about the culture and history without any of um, kind of the focus on minority groups, which I think often drive our view of Islam in the Arab world now. And I want to ask you all as professors and teachers um, and kind of a generation that's really lived through this and has to pass it on, how you think that we can now teach these in, in, a, in a manner that will help the younger generation grow up not in fear of it, but to develop and that we can actually move forward from this and work together. Because you've all mentioned that the younger generation, I think President Woods, you said this, younger generation actually has not grown up with this around us. So how do we now frame it and teach it in a way that would be productive in the future? Uh, 
I would say you're not burdened with it, that you are an example of what the future could hold in terms of your engaging uh, language and culture uh, of the Middle East, in this particular case, Arabic, and your unfettered or clear, um, you're not burdened by the pre-9-11 feelings and attitudes and approaches um, that we all were. And uh, I think that's significant and it's something that we as educators and other previous generations, so to speak, need to consider as we engage all of you. Um, so that's why I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because the burdens we're all talking about um, are burdens that are part of us, uh, very much so. And I'm not so sure. I think it's much more natural for your generation, as you're doing, uh, to engage these issues much more openly with a clear slate. So that's what I'm optimistic. Can I talk about teaching? Um, there's an organization which I can't say I've been actively involved in, but I've been inspired for. It's called Players for Peace. I don't know if any, any of you know about it, but um, I've got a couple of friends who've been very involved. And what it is is two guys who basically play basketball. They went out to uh, Northern Ireland at the worst time of the conflict. It seems like a very simple idea, but they had Protestants and Catholics, a mixed team, playing basketball. And it was a transformational event among young people that all of a sudden when you knew an Arab personally or you knew someone that not the whole world was um, characterized in an individual way, you had more acceptance and willingness to actually resolve conflict. And what they've done is then sent this to South Africa and it's also quite active. Um, it also has a big contingent um, in the Middle East and Israel. And particularly in the West Bank, um, when uh, they came in for a presentation, it was that there's some, um, whatever, the, the, the big sporting event, and it was this combined team who actually won um, the, uh, the big sort of you know, hotly contested basketball um, association. So I would counsel you, it's easy to say, how do you become more optimistic about the future? You come, become optimistic when you become unfrozen, when you take action. So there's an opportunity for all of you. I'm sure you all play basketball, have a friend who plays basketball, and instead of waiting for the older generation to take leadership, to take action, there's an opportunity for each of you to implement change. And fear comes with lack of knowledge. And the only way to unsettle and unblock fear is to reach out and to get to know people on an individual level. So when you start to see, let's shoot them up because you know these people, are, because there'll be other 9-11s. It's part of the fabric of the world we live in. And it's each, it's beholden on each of you to have a more informed view, to have a friend from Pakistan, to be able to reach out. So Players for Peace, um, check it out. It's one of other organizations, and I think it's something that makes me optimistic because it gives you a step-by-step -step plan how to change the future. Yeah, and on the, on the idea of teaching, I'd like to add that in the case of Arabic, you said we're in, a, in an Arabic class, I think the way uh, looking forward to a better, less burdened future is to take the teaching of Arabic out of the service model as I think we've done here in Middlebury, where you don't only learn Arabic to understand the mysterious dangers of it, but maybe you might end up focusing and spending your life studying Arabic poetry. Medieval, could be. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, where you can start valuing Arabic language and literature as we have do other languages, aside from conflicts and wars and fears and, and burdens. Right. Thank you to all our panelists for sharing with us tonight. I want to take this opportunity to share a few things, maybe no um, one else in the audience will be able to or anything. Um, so those two things are really, um, military background and a uh, big interest in, in astronomy as a business as major. So I actually just got home from school. Um, when the attacks happened in 9-11. So I was living in Germany at the time. Um, six hour time difference. Uh, my parents were in the army and uh, were stationed there. And um, after those attacks occurred, soldiers in M16s roaming the neighborhood was a common sight. This wasn't even a military base, it was just an American neighborhood. Um, 
really strong security on all sorts of bases, getting your car searched even if you're an American. So that was interesting to see how the security changed overnight. My my parents were deployed actually at the same time in 2003. They started the uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, so while I support the military, I'm proud of my parents. Um, pretty strong pacifist, and, and that's and that's. Um, largely due to a good friend of mine, Carl Sagan. Um, if I could have anyone on this um, on this panel, it would, it would be him. So I, I think we could all, or I would like to think, um, a lot of us would agree, some cosmic perspective um, shows how shameful the unfortunate aspects of human nature are, such as the ones on 9-11. Um, so for Everyone's enjoying it. I wanted to share a few quotes um, by Carl Sagan. In our tenure on this planet, we've accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsider, outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. But we've also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great soaring, passionate intelligence clear tools for our continued survival and prosperity. Which aspects of our nation will prevail is uncertain, particularly when our visions and prospects are bound to one small part of the small planet Earth. But up there in the cosmos, an inescapable perspective awaits. National boundaries are not evident when we view the Earth from space. The natural, ethnic, or religious, or national identifications are a little difficult to support when we see our Earth as a fragile blue crescent fading to become an inconspicuous point of light against the bastion in the citadel of the stars. Carl Sagan wrote that in 1980 in his book Cosmos. That image of the Earth fading actually came true when the Voyager spacecraft took a picture of Earth from um, four billion miles away beyond the orbit of Pluto. Um, that inspired the book Pebble Dot, Carl Sagan writes, um, sure enough, Earth appeared as a mere speck from four million miles away. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish this pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Two more. Our science and our technology have posed to us a profound question. Will we learn to use these tools with wisdom and foresight before it's too late? Will we see our species safely through this difficult passage so that our children and grandchildren will continue the great journey of discovery still deeper into the mysteries of the cosmos? That same rocket and nuclear and computer technology that sends our ships, like Voyager, past the farthest known planet can also be used to destroy our global civilization. Exactly the same technology can be used for good and for evil. It is as if there were a God who said to us, I said before you two ways. You can use your technology to destroy yourselves or to carry you to the planets and the stars. It's up to you. Last quote. Every one of us is, in a cosmic perspective, precious. If a human disagrees with you, let him live. In a hundred billion galaxies, you will not find another roughly the number of galaxies in the universe. Um, so the attack um, itself and the deaths and the cost that the reaction had um, has caused in the American people a way, a different way of thinking. Um, and it has also changed the way that American policymakers make those policies. But well, it seems to me that the tens of thousands of deaths um, in Afghanistan and Iraq since have not changed the way Americans make their policies. And my question is whether these deaths, as compared to the roughly 3,000 deaths from the attack, have changed the way Americans, American citizens think, and whether you think that in the near future we possible that the U.S. policymakers would take into account the deaths of civilians in other parts of the world 
when they are defending the American interest, national interest, and well, do you think that at some point, hopefully soon, um, the U.S. will start to balance out the value that an American life has and the value that a life of another human being anywhere else could be Mexico, where I'm from, or it could be the Middle East, or it could be somewhere in northern India or in China. Do you think that at some point the value of these lives for the U.S. government is going to become at least a little bit more equal? Say one brief thing about that, which is uh, not inattentive, uh, and I w wish that wasn't the case. Uh, when you do look at the way the U.S. military prioritizes its spending, right, to spend a million dollars uh, on a, a, a U.S. soldier fighting in these wars uh, versus the amount it spends on civilian protection, and civilian protection is admittedly a priority in the U.S. military. Uh, you still have a gross imbalance in the, the resources and attention paid to an American life versus other lives. Uh, one positive thing I do have to say is that uh, the global information environment is rapidly changing. Uh, Al Jazeera English, which was you know, unheard of a few years ago, uh, is now particularly good at highlighting the, the challenges civilians face in the Middle East and other places all around the world. Uh, it's becoming increasingly easy to see very visually uh, and feel the pain of suffering uh, regardless of where you are. And I think that that does have an effect on public opinion and ultimately they can filter into decisions that are made. So th there are some changes in the visibility uh, over time and I think that will increase. Uh, the sad reality is, is as you say, that, uh, that the resources are allocated very differently depending on where you're coming from. Thank you. Um, maybe this might be a good time to wrap up. Um, uh, maybe some of the speakers might still be around for some personal conversations afterwards if they have time. But other than that, I would like to thank again our speakers for um, their contributions and would like to thank you all very much for coming.